And we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Lisa F. Jackson. Lisa F. Jackson has been involved in documentary filmmaking for over 35 years. Her work has brought her many awards, including three Emmy nominations, two Emmy Awards, and four Sin Golden Eagles. She has directed and or edited dozens of films for PBS, including Voices and Visions, Emily Dickinson, Jackson Pollock, Portrait Through Madness, a 1993 New York City Emmy winner, Bill Moyer's Journal, the prize-winning series The Mind, and segments for Sesame Street and Live from Lincoln Center. She has produced and directed for Court TV, HBO, ABC News, MTV, The Learning Channel, ABC Sports, HBO Sports, and The Hallmark Channel, amongst others. And she is here to talk about her new documentary film, which is playing tonight at the Seattle Human Rights Film Festival, The Greatest Silence, Rape in the Congo. Let's uh, begin. If you would start out and tell us, what was the motivation in producing your film, The Greatest Silence? Uh, the Greatest Silence, Rape in the Congo is about, basically it's about a forgotten women in a forgotten war. For the last 10 or 12 years, there's been a humongous conflict raging in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is in the heart of Africa. And I have been researching and been aware of for years the incredible toll on women and girls of on in conflict and uh, the actually the the um, the title for the film comes from a UN report that was done years ago that calls violence against women and girls one of history's greatest silences so I read that report in early 2001 and thought I would do sort of a survey film. Uh, I would go to Kosovo, I would go to Sierra Leone, I would go to Burma, I would go to Colombia, I would go to the Congo and look at the fate of women and girls in conflict. And of course, in modern warfare, civilians are are, are intentionally targeted. Uh, at the turn of the century, 90% of the casualties were military and now 90% of the casualties are civilian. And a huge number of those are women and girls who are not uh, killed, they are raped, and they are invisible statistics in in modern conflict. So I went to the Congo in um, in 2006 initially just to do um, I thought a little bit of research to find out exactly how bad the problem was. Maybe it was a part of this larger film. But after spending several three weeks in the conflict zones in in eastern Congo, I realized that this was a story that nobody was telling, and that it was. It was a whole film. So I spent a uh, month and a half, two months there, actually three, three months there in 2006 and went back again in 2007. And this is the result. And can you give us a brief overview of uh, the history of the Congo, kind of how it got to where it is currently? Well, the Democratic Republic of Congo, we probably remember better as Zaire, the scene of the rumble in the jungle. Was it Ali Frazier? Yeah. Um, but it was a Belgian colony in the late uh, 1700, late 1800s, and was completely pillaged by King Leopold, who just sacked the country, uh, taking out rubber and ivory and killing half the native population. There are photographs from that era that show uh, guys in pith helmets holding hand, baskets full of hands, because people, you know, if you didn't meet your quota for the rubber uh, rubber barons, your hands were amputated. So it has a huge, long history of just being sacked and desecrated by, by the first world. It's an incredibly rich country. It, it's uh, bordered, by nine different, um, as, uh, bordered by nine different countries, all of whom variously, Angola, Rwanda, uh, Burundi, um, Sudan, um, uh, have all come across the borders to pillage its incredible resources, which include mineral uh, minerals, uh, petroleum, diamonds, uh, and, a, and a mineral called coltan, which has become my sort of pet issue. Coltan is a mineral that, uh, without which you cannot make a Sony PlayStation, a remote control, a laptop computer, or a cell phone. And it can be argued that there is the blood of Congolese women on your cell phone. So what is going on now, in East, particularly in eastern Congo, is a resource war, where in the last 10 or 12 years, uh, almost uh, over five million people have died, and when you look at that number, it's it's ten Darfurs have happened in the Congo, but it's a war in slow motion. It's an invisible war that has not gotten the media attention that Darfur has. I'm, I'm not quite sure why that is. Maybe Darfur is, you know, you can attach the term genocide to Darfur, and a lot of people get all excited. 
and attach George Clooney, and that, you know, triples the excitement. But nobody yet is really talking about what's going on in Congo and the First World's uh, complicity in what is going on in Congo. And so I chose to tell the story of that, that poor, that poor conflict-wracked country through the voices of its women. So you, when you went over and you started um, doing this work, tell us about your first <clears throat> interviews and stuff. Well, I knew that I wanted to hear the stories of women. And I, I came to, uh, well, a little bit of my own backstory. I, I was gang raped when I was in my 20s and really didn't talk about it too much. The three men who attacked me in Washington, D.C. were never found. The statute of limitations has since expired. So um, it was something that I got over. Uh, it sort of... Um, uh, colored my perspective on a lot of things for the rest of my life. So I thought it only fair in asking these women to tell me about the worst thing that had ever happened to them to tell them a little bit, bit about my own backstory. So every woman I interviewed in the film, um, and there were dozens and dozens of them, I told them first about my own gang rape. And they never, they, they couldn't believe it. They asked me about the war that was happening in my country. How could a woman like me suffer like they had, I mean, not. I don't want to compare it at all, if in a country uh, that is at peace. And I basically said that women everywhere are potential victims of sexual violence. And so they told me their stories um, with such frankness and such pulverizing detail. And I think a lot of them were telling me their stories because I was the first one who had asked, who listened to them without judgment, um, and with compassion, and this was not something that they were used to. Um, and these were not only women who were part of, uh, you know, who were uh, being helped by local um, NGOs, but I traveled with uh, UN peacekeepers. I got uh, uh, credited with the peacekeepers and went deep into the bush and spent, uh, you know, five or six days at a time, you know, sleeping on a cot in a church parish hall and, and meeting these women who would sometimes stand in line until there was no light because they just wanted someone to listen. And I would keep rolling even though there was, you know, I wasn't even getting an image um, because I couldn't say, you know, I don't want to hear your stories or, um, you know, we've run out of time or, you know, the conditions are wrong. But come, I'll listen. And they came in unbelievable numbers. And the stories themselves, I had the luck to see your film last night. The stories themselves, each incredibly unique, yet there is a theme that keeps rolling through these. Can you tell us about that? Well, when people talk about, um, when the rare person talks about uh, rape in the, in the war in the Congo, they talk about widespread rape. And I think the terms... The terms need to be changed. It's systematic rape. Systematic rape by not only um, a lot of the the, the, the current problem in, in the Congo, um, in eastern Congo, started after the Rwandan genocide in 94, 95. And tens of thousands of, of Hutu genociders um, flooded from Rwanda over the border into Congo where they were um, actually supported uh, by uh, huge amounts of U.S. aid. There was a huge camp that was set up in eastern Congo to accommodate these. these. They saw them as refugees. But anyway, tens of thousands have remained in those mountains and are responsible for 60, 70 percent of the atrocities. But there are likewise militias from Uganda and from Burundi, and the Congolese army itself is ra are raping the women. And the stories that you hear... They commonly start, it was the middle of the night, and they broke into our homes. And the, the, the rapes are just unspeakable and, and unimaginable in the, the level of brutality. Um, the women are gang raped in front of their families. Um, they are mutilated um, and with the intention not of killing them. So if a, if a soldier puts a, a rifle and fires it into a woman's vagina, it's to destroy her, 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 her femaleness um, and not to kill her. They do it in, intentionally not to kill her, but that she will 
become incontinent. She will be uh, leaking urine and feces. She is rejected by her family. She is kicked out of her village. Um, they, they often die from sort of the, you know, in, infections that result from, from the rapes. But in eastern Congo, there were only two hospitals that can deal with this condition, which is called its traumatic fistula. And sometimes they will walk for weeks, months through the bush to get to these hospitals, and multiple operations are required to stitch them back together. Some of them will stay in the hospitals for two or three years and still not be whole. Um, but the when I say systematic, uh, it is a strategy of the war. It's cheaper than bullets, and it guarantees that you are destroying the center of the culture. And um, in a lot of... Uh, you know, in, well, in Eastern Congo, I'll speak specifically, the women are the center. They, they raise the children, they work the fields, they nurture, they keep the family together. And when the woman is destroyed, she is kicked out of her, out of her village. She often has four or five, six children who she then has to care for and is unable to care for. The children become then pickings for the militia. They're conscripted as child soldiers. They become slaves in the very coltan mines that are the source of this, this whole uh, conflict. And uh, the, the, the culture falls apart. And so that's why I say it's systematic. And uh, the International Rescue Committee, the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, I mean, there are many NGOs that have done um, – uh, have looked at this problem and will agree that what is going on is not opportunistic rape. It's intentional. And you had examples in your film of entire villages where the women were gang raped and mutilated and entire families where that had occurred. Yeah, over and over and over again. And uh, the humiliation, uh, it's not only the the you know, the, the, the physical destruction of, of the woman. But when she is raped by 10 soldiers in front of her village and her husband is made to watch, um, in a way, the, you know, the, the, the husbands are, are psychologically raped also. I mean, they are shamed. They have not been able to protect their family. And that's a lot of the reason for the subsequent abandonment. Um, and yes, I heard stories from girls as young as 8 and 10, women in their 70s. There was a woman who was 78 years old who was raped by four uh, militia. And again, they, all, they have uniforms. They come in the night, so the women don't know. Are they Congolese? Are they Rwandese? Um, but she said to these men, you can't rape me. I'm an old woman. And they said to her, you're not too old for us. And, you know... Here's, here's a woman in her 70s who should be allowed to live, live out her years in peace. And she was put through this nightmare and now lives alone in a, in a hut with, you know, dozens of other women who have faced the same fate. You had some surprising interviews. I mean, all of them are, are great interviews, but surprising from the fact that you actually had several sessions uh, interviewing rapists in that film. Can you tell us about that? It was sort of chilling, and it was... I had this marvelous uh, Congolese uh, colleague who worked for the UN Peacekeepers um, and who accompanied me into the bush uh, on a lot of the, the trips that I took, Bernard. And I asked Bernard if, if it was possible to find some of the men who did this, because if there were... If 350, 400, 500,000 women have been raped... Who are the people who are doing this? And Bernard found me a dozen soldiers who, who I interviewed. They were completely unabashed and spoke without shame or fear of reprisal uh, about what they had done. And, I mean, that's another tremendous problem in the Congo. There is a culture of impunity there where rape goes unpunished. There are uh, military officers very high in uh, President Kabila's cabinet who are known rapists who during their time uh, in, in the military have said to their soldiers, go find me a bushwife. Um, and there, there, there's no criminal justice system. The, the jails don't have locks. If you are arrested for, for sexual violence, a bribe of 2 or $3, you'll walk free. 
Um, so one of the things that I hope this film can can do going forward is to bring sort of a sh- to shame the uh, the government in in the Congo to to give some measure of justice to these women. But the men who I talked to considered it their right. Um, they, of course, blamed the war, the deprivation of living in the bush. Um, also claimed that they were not responsible for the atrocities; that it was the it was the Hutu militia or the, you know, the the militia from Burundi that they Congolese soldiers they quote unquote only raped. Um, but they would, uh, you know, I, I asked them how many how many women they had raped: two, five, twelve, twenty five. I've lost count. Um, and they all held themselves to the same exquisite double standard. I asked them if they had wives, sisters, um, and what would they think if their wife or sister or mother was raped. And, of course, to a man, they said, oh, I wouldn't stand for it. I would kill whoever raped my wife. Uh, the exception to that were, were militia um, from the Mai Mai. Uh, the Mai Mai, um, before they were absorbed in the Congolese army, were responsible for some of the war's worst atrocities. And they actually believe that raping a woman gives them strength in battle. So I asked one of the Mai Mai, if you found a man raping your wife, what would you do? He said, well, it depends. If he was raping her to save the Congo, I would do nothing. So there is a whole, you know, sort of superstition and a lot of sort of, you know, witchcraft, if you will, around um, around rape, at least for, for the my mind, some of the, the less enlightened militia. But do you think it's fair to say that the responsibility goes beyond the rapists themselves as well, that the society there, the, the government and the society bear some of the blame on this? Well, you know, where you, 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 you can point fingers in so many directions. Um, there is so much corruption in the Congo that the the, the Congolese army, um, they aren't paid. They they live in the bush for months at a time without food. I interviewed a peacekeeper with the UN who said that because of that corruption, um, they they take. They go into the villages, they steal the goats, they take the food, and they rape the women because part of it is obviously that, you know, women are devalued. They're considered, you know, they are somewhere, uh, uh, you know, they have the rights of livestock, basically. So to, to, to rape a woman is the equivalent of stealing a cow. I mean, they don't consider it, they consider it their right. Um, so the, in, the, the rapes committed by the Congolese army, yes, you can point the finger to the corruption in, in Kabila's government, that they're not, there's no discipline. Um, it's a very, uh, you know, they're not fed. Um, they have ragtag uniforms, so they they take um, the other rapes. The ones that are committed by foreign militias, um, you, you know, you can put the responsibility on not only the foreign governments, but I think on multinational corporations who depend on the resources in the Congo and are um, using these militia to maintain the chaos necessary to exploit those resources and. So, you know, look at Motorola, look at Nokia, look at Sony. Um, you know, we all, we all have, we all bear some, some complicity. We all, we all are slightly responsible. So where to point the finger? I own a cell phone. Am, how, how responsible am I? Yeah, well, I think once people have the knowledge of that, uh, the connections there, then I think the responsibility comes with that. There was a, uh, a conversation on, during the film of people were asking some of the survivors if they had uh, told the government about it and what their reaction was, as well as uh, there was an interesting one where um, they'd asked someone about if they'd told people in the upper class about it. That was my impression. Oh, yeah. There was an interview I did with, um, or a scene with a woman who was a a well-known activist from the upper, she's an upper class woman from, from Eastern Congo, and she had she was asked, you know, if she tried to bring uh, to the attention of, you know, the the upper class Congolese this this horrible problem. And what she said was that they told her it's it's not our problem, it's not our problem. Um, the film is actually going to be shown. I should put a plug in for HBO. It'll be on HBO on April eighth, and um, and we'll play many many times on April April in in April May June over the next year. But uh, likewise, the British government has uh, 
has given us a grant to translate the film into Lingala and Swahili and is buying time on Congolese television because they want to use the film to start a debate within the Congo about why this is happening because it's not something that is discussed in the high levels of Kabila's cabinet. It's not something that and, and because it's happening in the east and this is a country this is a country the size of western europe that has less than 500 miles of paved roads the infrastructure is a disaster um and so that what is happening in eastern congo often people in the in the west where the capital is have no clue um so hopefully this film will be used uh in in the country to begin uh to spark a debate among the congolese about how they are allowing this to happen. I had just seen when it, she had made that comment about the well-to-do not caring that I just saw a parallel between that and us here in the U.S. You know, there's, there's so much difference between us and them wealth-wise and resource and so. Yeah, I mean, it's so easy to, um, you know, from where we're sitting in, in a comfortable studio in Seattle or my home in New York City to think of, to reduce what happens in, in parts of Africa to, oh, just tribal craziness. You know, they're just out there killing each other. But you know what? It's a lot more complicated than that and, and oddly enough, a lot simpler than that. It's not it's, – it's, uh, it's, it's, about, it's about resources. It's about and, – and also it's about a legacy of violence that uh, begins with uh, imperialism, begins with colonialism, begins with – uh, you know, a country being divided uh, along borders that have nothing to do with the ethnic tribal realities and carved into, you know, into states and countries that are that suit the first world but have nothing to do with the realities of of that of that world. So do you see your film as perhaps one of the first steps in uh, ending this history of violence? I don't know if it's going to do anything to end the history of violence, but I think it it may serve as a wedge to wake people up to it. Um, the film is being shown in the the House of Commons, for instance, in early March. Um, uh, Senator Dick Durbin has a uh, is the chairman of a, of the uh, subcommittee on human rights in the U.S. Senate, and his chief counsel called me a couple of weeks ago because she'd heard about the film. And as a result, uh, they're having a special special hearings on sexual violence and conflict in the Congo on April 1st, and they're going to show a, uh, a section of the film at, in, in the Senate, and maybe it will bring some attention within that governing body because uh, we give a lot of aid to the Congo. Uh, Senators Obama and, and Brownback, for instance, sponsored a huge package of aid to the Congo uh, last year. And I think that aid should be contingent on meeting certain human rights benchmarks. Uh, we give money to the Congolese army to support the Congolese army. And that aid should not go forward until members of the army who are raping are brought to justice and are condemned in, in the eyes of the world and put in jail. Um, I hope that uh, there, the film might – we want to show it in the International Criminal Court in The Hague – because even though there are warlords from the Congo who are uh, in The Hague now um, being prosecuted for, for, for crimes against humanity, those crimes are a whole laundry list that start with torture of civilians, uh, conscription of child soldiers. And, but there is not one person in the docket in, in The Hague that is there for sexual violence. You know, rape is always part of a laundry list. It's way down on the list. And somebody needs to to stand trial in the in in the criminal world criminal court for sexual violence so that some precedent can be established that 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 is that says this is a crime this is a war crime rape is a crime of war have you shown your film uh to some of the survivors <clears throat> that you portrayed in it i actually got a, a grant last year from um amnesty and i did a, a 15 minute version of the film all in Swahili that I took back to the Congo last May and showed in Pansy Hospital to amazing response. The women watched it transfixed, and these were 250 women uh, rape survivors at the hospital. They asked to see it again and then to see it again. And first of all, they 
I think they felt very validated. There were some women there who were who saw themselves on the screen. I mean, this is I, a year later. I go back to Pansy, and they are still there. Um, so they felt very validated. There was something about seeing themselves or their sisters uh, on a television screen that somehow made uh, it sort of it honored their experience. I think is what uh, their their feeling was. Um, there was a we had a sort of a question and answer period afterwards, and women said um, what they had learned from the film, that they learned that they are not to blame for for the rapes, that uh, that uh, once when they are raped, their their husbands should still love them, that the people raping them are also raping their country. Uh, so it was it was an amazing response, and there are dozens of NGOs working in in the Congo now who are. There are hundreds of copies of those DVDs circulating in Eastern Congo, which is very, very gratifying. Only a few minutes left. So how has producing this documentary film changed you? How has it changed me? Well, I've been making documentaries for so many years and and so many hundreds of conversations with people in crisis, uh, but I feel a particular responsibility to the women I talk to. They all said to me, we want, we want the world to know what is happening to us. And the courage that it took for them to break their own silence um, is a tremendous responsibility that I bear and I think that we all bear. And I feel, I feel that responsibility and I feel the, the need to, to, honor, to honor them and to... And to fulfill my promise to them to, that the world will hear their stories and hopefully uh, the film and their testimony will make a difference. What uh, solutions do you see to this problem if you were elected to the position uh, oh. <laughs> here in the States where you had the oh. power to be able to enact changes? Uh, you know, where does one begin to unravel, you know, uh, a legacy of, of, of violence and exploitation. Um, I mean, we're trying to put together some sort of uh, outreach strategy where people, when people see the film, they're pissed off. They want to do something. And we, by the time it airs on HBO in April, we want to have something in place so that people can give money, they can volunteer, they can uh, write to their congressman, they can write to Kabila. Um, we're trying to put, get something together where after you see the film, you can send a text message to your, your cell phone provider um, to say, is there the blood of Congolese women on my cell phone? If so, I want to know what you're doing about it. Um, blood coltan, I think, is a, a tremendous concept that we can take forward. I think we should just all look at ourselves and, and see the connection. I mean, they are not other. These women are not other. They are... They are, they are me. They are my sisters. They are our sisters. And we are responsible for them. Um, I mean, not in a patronizing way, not in a, you know, a first world, third world way, but in a human way. And I would just hope that people would, you know, use their own imaginations about how to help because th there are infinite ways. There are infinite ways to help. And we are, we have to. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. We've been talking with Lisa Jackson. She is the director, producer, screenwriter, editor, uh, mm -hmm. all of the above of the new documentary film, The Greatest Silence, Rape in the Congo. And is there a website or a way of uh, communicating with you? People? Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, uh, the film's website is thegreatestsilence.org. And there's a link there to uh, dozens of organizations where people can can learn more about the conflict, can 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 help. And again, the HBO air date is April 8th at 10 o'clock. So, all right. Well, I want to thank you for coming in this morning. Thanks a lot, Mike.